Uh, so my name is Susan Cleary, and it is my pleasure to be able to facilitate this afternoon session, which is on capitation-based financing for, for primary care. And our intention, as always in these salad webinars, is to foreground um, learnings that um, are of, of value to those working at the coal face of the health system, um, specifically in the district health system. And so our intention is to learn lessons from the ground up as we all seek to come together to promote equity in the country and to learn lessons to strengthen the national health insurance reform. So welcome to everybody. Um, my job at the moment is, is, to, is to briefly um, provide a bit of an overview uh, about what this webinar is about. So this webinar builds on a previous discussion of austerity, uh, as well as another discussion on resource management at a district level. And we have an amazing lineup of speakers today, and I will briefly introduce them now before um, introducing them again a bit later. So Plaxi Chiwira has worked in the field of health economics for the past 12 years within a variety of spaces, including NGOs and within government. Um, she is currently employed in the Western Cape Department of Health and Wellness. Also from the department, we have Simon Kay, who is the head of corporate services support and the chief financial officer of the Western Cape Department of Health and Wellness. In addition, we have Barry Charles, who's a leading actuary in healthcare in South Africa. He co-founded Insight Actuaries and Consultants in 2014, growing Insight to be the largest healthcare actuarial consultancy in the country, including expanding into new fields of practice locally and abroad during the 2020s. Shabir Musa leads Family Medicine in Joburg Health District and is an Associate Professor at Wits University of Witwatersrand at Wits. He is clinically based in Soweto, so supporting a community-oriented primary health care model for national health insurance. He is lead project manager for Gauteng's proof of concept in developing a contracting unit for PHC in Soweto. And finally, we have Moremi Nkosi, who is a health economist with substantial experience in both academia and government. He is newly appointed as chief director, healthcare benefits and provider payment design in the National Health Insurance Branch at National Department of Health. So welcome um, to all of our, our speakers and thank you so much once again for giving of your valuable time and expertise this afternoon. Um, so everybody else, a very warm welcome to you too. We encourage you to please use the chat box to make comments and add reflections and um, within a safe, this is a safe space. And so our intention is really to, um, to learn together. Um, we also have created this word cloud. And so what we are asking you is just to engage a little bit with the word cloud, which you can do by going to mentimeter.com and entering the code that you will see in the box at the bottom, or you can use your camera to scan the QR code. Uh, oh, sorry, I think I just drew on the screen by mistake. Um, so please go ahead and start doing that. We're gonna give you a few minutes to do that while, while people are settling in. So please go ahead and go to Mentimeter and answer the question of what words come to mind when you think about capitation-based financing. So Carissa is, is no longer in presentation mode. Um, we are recording this session, and so we hope that you give us permission to record um, and that by your participation, you have given us permission to report, uh, to record. Um, I also want to thank everybody for the interesting and insightful questions that you have submitted when you registered. We have done our best to weave some of these questions into our program. And again, we encourage you to add them to the chat. Um, there were many questions that were posed, uh, many difficult questions. Um, I do not know the answer to all of these questions myself, um, but it's, it's fantastic to see the level of thinking that went into some of these questions. So for example, there was a question about 
Um, how do you build in measures in a capitation model to prevent underservicing and unnecessary referrals? A very important question. Another question was, um, what will be the capitation fee for GPs and will there be a minimum and maximum number of citizens that will be permitted per GP um, and so on? Um, so we, we won't, will not necessarily be able to answer all of these questions um, and perhaps it will be necessary to convene another webinar to address some of these questions. But where possible, we are hoping to at least respond to, to some of your interest. So, Carissa, um, if that's okay, um, can you so put just, the slides back into... So, just forgive yeah. us, we're sorting the slides out. There's a, just a little challenge with slides, so forgive us, okay. we're just sorting it out. Okay. All right. So, colleagues, carry on um, engaging with the, the Mentimeter. Oh, I see. So, this is what you are coming up with so far. And, oh, there we go. That's very interesting. So these are the words that are coming to your mind when you think about capitation-based financing. So in the middle is equity, which isn't surprising, as well as efficiency, population health, um, ceiling of payment, that's interesting. Um, quality problem, that's also interesting. Um, fairness, opportunity, population-specific Yeah, that's very interesting. So, Carissa, Lucy, um, how will we be able to continue to view the Mentimeter? Can we come back to it after my presentation? Sounds like a good idea, Sue. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so then let's come back to the main slides, please. Okay, thank you very much. So what I'm hoping to do very briefly is to provide some sort of background contextualization of what we mean by capitation-based financing mechanisms. Next slide, please. So I'm going to try to distinguish between two different types of capitation. Firstly, capitation is a mechanism to enable an equitable share of a budget to a ge geographical area. And secondly, capitation as a mechanism to pay providers. Next slide, please. So firstly, if we think about capitation as equitable share, this is something we can understand quite well already in South Africa because it forms a key aspect of how we currently divide up our government budget. And so our constitution um, indicates that we should have an equitable share of nationally raised revenue allocated to provinces. And this then leads to the construction of the provincial equitable share formula. And within this quite large formula, there is a specific health component, um, which was revised quite recently in 2020, 2021. And what it basically entails is a risk adjustment whereby the, the per capita amount, the amount that is allocated per population, is adjusted up or down depending on proxies of healthcare need so that uh, a larger per capita amount is given to populations that potentially could have a higher need for healthcare. And these proxies in the national formula include age, sex, total fertility rate, people living with HIV. Then there's also an indicator for sparsity. So we know that it is much more expensive to deliver health services in very rural settings. So that's why there's a sparsity indicator. And then there's an indicator for premature mortality, which I think makes sense to all of us, as well as a multiple deprivation index, which is another way that um, and another aspect of equity is baked into the formula. In, adjust, in addition to the risk adjustment component, there's an output component that is basically to do with uh, the demand 
for healthcare that is realized on the ground. So that's what we have at the moment in South Africa at the national level. So you can already see that there's quite a lot of thinking that goes into making sure that there is some measure of equity achieved. Next slide, please. This then leads to um, national treasury allocating monies to provincial treasuries. And provincial treasuries in our fiscal federal system have discretion regarding how they then choose to split up their, their overall allocate, allocation. And on average, 33% of this money is transferred to provincial departments of health, but there is some variation because there is discretion. So provincial treasuries can choose to allocate slightly differently. So you'll see that Gauteng, for example, chooses to allocate 38%, whereas the Northern Cape chooses to allocate 29% with the rest of the provinces sitting somewhere in between. And so this discretion at the provincial level then generates different per capita allocations for health between provinces. Next slide, please. From there, the provincial departments of health allocate funding to hospitals, including provincial, regional, and some tertiary, and they also allocate to the district health services, which is what we are particularly interested in today. And these allocations are largely historical in nature. Next slide, please. And so this is then illustrated and linking back to our previous salad webinar on monitoring and evaluation, this then links back to um, data that we can get from the district health barometer, which tells us how we are doing in terms of this measure of um, equity. On the left hand side, you have the provincial and local government DHS expenditure. On the right hand side, you have the PHC expenditure. And as you can see, there is, of course, variation across the provinces. Next slide, please. And it's also slightly confusing to work out how we're doing on equity, because what this messy slide is, is, is wanting to show you is that a province that, for example, allocates quite a high per capita amount on the DHS level um, potentially is allocating quite a low amount um, if you just look at primary health care. Next slide, please. And it gets even messier if you go down to the district level. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there is potential inequity at the moment in the system in terms of the per capita allocations. Next slide. So that is then the first version of capitation that we want to highlight in the webinar, but there is another version of capitation that's quite key to the national health insurance reform, and that is capitation as a mechanism to pay providers. Next slide. In this form of capitation, healthcare provider now is paid a set amount for set period of time for each user registered under their care, and if this is also a risk adjusted measure, then that provider as before gets paid for each user differently depending on certain user characteristics. So for example, you would expect to be paid more for a 70 year old user um, registered in your practice than for a 20 year old user, even if the 20 year old in fact uses far more health services than the 70 year old. Next slide, please. So in order to implement this, this mechanism of a capitated provider payment, the NHI will change the way funding flows in the country, in effect, removing the role of the provincial treasuries. And so what will happen is the health component of the provincial equitable share will be removed and the health funds will flow direct from national treasury to the NHI fund. And the fund, as we know, will act as the single purchaser next slide. Under Section 35, the NHI Act then says that funds for primary health care services must be reimbursed directly to these providers um, and that the, an accredited provider must be reimbursed by the fund in accordance with the prescribed capitation strategy. And our understanding is that will become clearer through um, regulations. Next slide. So to conclude, um, I'm trying to distinguish between two forms of capitation here. The one is the equitable share style model of capitation, which is the one that we are currently seeing in the public sector of the South African health system, versus the form that um, is being envisaged under the National Health Insurance Act, 
where the equitable allocation will be enabled through registering a user in a health facility and paying that facility accordingly. And as I think we can all imagine, this is a, a large change, particularly in the public sector, in terms of how healthcare is funded. Next slide. So that sort of is the end of my hopefully brief enough overview of what this webinar is about. And so I would now like to um, invite our, our main speaker, uh, Dr. Plaxi Chiwera, to give her presentation and just to reintroduce her. Plaxi has worked in the field of health economics for a, a considerable amount of time and currently is employed in the Western Cape Government Health and Wellness. And um, the department has been piloting and innovating around um, the first form of capitation for quite some time now. And we are really excited to see this presentation and, and to hear more about how it's been going and the lessons that have been learned from an implementation perspective. And then after that, the rest of our speakers are going to come together in a panel discussion to reflect on what we've heard from Plaxi, um, to answer a few extra questions that I've weaved in, and, and potentially also some questions um, from the chat. So Plaxi, over to you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Plax. You can call me Plax. Um, I work for the Department of Health. Um, we were funded by the Bill Gates Foundation together with Percept, and we worked with UCT into looking into the equitable resource allocation. So just to give a brief overview of where the project started. So we sat around on the table some five, six, seven years ago in the department and started wondering with the historical kind of budgeting that we have been doing, do we necessarily understand in terms of the number of people that we are serving, how can we translate each dollar or each rand amount to the number of people that we are serving? And um, then started the project, uh, Stefanus Fari was one of the guys who was on the team um, and he left for Powell Hospital. And then we continued with the um, project. Next slide. So basically where we're coming from, as Sue mentioned, historical budgeting. Um, for those who are not too familiar with that, this is a point where from the provincial side of you, we would get our budget. We would then decide within our budget how much we are going to allocate to our providers. But at the same time, it will be looking at what was allocated in the previous year or years before and how we can adjust that either by CPI or a little bit of factors, but not necessarily using the nice to know formulas or the risk adjustment formulas to come up with the budget for that particular year or the MTEF period, which is the three year period um, that we plan for within government. So in looking at historical budgeting, we realize this is unresponsive to changing populations and health needs. It embeds inefficiencies where they exist. In some cases, there are areas where they might not exist. We are not as bad as you think we are. We are as a government. We have spaces that we actually very good at. It also embeds historical inequities. Um, if you look at spaces where, which have been benefiting previously and we keep on using the same budget and adjusting it by CPI alone, that would mean those spaces would continuously gain while spaces that actually really need the services are not gaining. Next slide. So what we did is basically look at the population of Western Cape and look at the budget that we had at that particular moment in time and try to understand how many people are they in the, in the city of Cape Town and what percentage of the budget are they actually getting in terms of um, the government budget and not the whole health budget for Western Cape province, but basically the public uh, aspect of it, government expenditure. So for example, 50, with the um, population at that time, the census at that time, 50.4% of the people who were in Cape Town were actually 
being allocated 60.2%. And you can see in the central Karoo, 6.5%. The allocation was way below what you probably have had. Maybe we would have wanted a situation where there's a little bit of a, a same level kind of thing happening there, but it was not the case at that time. Next slide. So where, where were we going? It was basically to develop a more equitable way of allocating resources between health districts and sub-districts within the Western Cape Department. We have 32 sub-districts um, and we have six districts. So how do we then reallocate our funds, looking at the different contexts of each district and within each district, things are not the same. For example, if you go into Cape Town, you have a whole different kind of population with different health needs um, from one side, from the southern side, from the western side, from the eastern side. So the idea was to really dig deep and find out what is happening in the and how do we then allocate and bridge that equity gap that we had. Next slide. So um, I think we can skip this one. Oh, okay, it's fine. We can go through it. Sua has mentioned the provincial equitable share formula, which is used at national, where the province then gets their budget. And from the budget level, from the provincial level, we then divide that to district and to sub-district. How we do it, province allocates the health funds to each district within the province, and then the district managers allocate their funds to the health service sub-districts and to the facilities. But of course, working with province to do that. Next slide. So in all the thinking and putting our heads together, what we then decided was if National is using this PACE formula, of which we had set with National as well as part of the team that reviewed the PACE formula in the, I think, 2020, we also then decided uh, with Percept who had worked on the PACE formula at National, how can we then translate this into uh, the Western Cape provincial government sphere. And we said, let's try and replicate that, but let's then risk adjust according to our own context of the Western Cape. So it was basically to look at the needs-based component of the Western Cape, look at the utilization component, which is the demand side of things. And in terms of the needs benefits um, based component, it basically was to measure population health need for each geographical area. Next slide. And as per the PS formula, we did include age and sex, um, multiple deprivation, sparsity, premature mortality. And for the utilization component, what we called service volume units, but that's basically the number of visits or, um, or the number of headcounts at uh, primary health care. And uh, the supply side factor, we also were looking at, um, we also kind of added the different sizes of the hospitals, um, each particular hospital, how many people would we expect to be seen at a CHC and with those CHCs in those different areas. But as we moved along, we, we also realized trauma and violence is actually one of the big aspects in, uh, in Western Cape, it's a big issue. So we also included it in the model and we included the chronic disease uh, numbers as well in the model on the utilization component. But because of data issues, we ended up saying, okay, we will include them in the model, but we will switch them off and switch them off when we have better data for that. And in terms of the trauma and violence, I think the biggest factor was we could account for bodies at, um, a certain area where the mortuary is, but we can't necessarily take them geographically from where they're actually coming from and where they have been receiving services. It's not necessarily that you go to that mortuary where you have been receiving your health services. So in the absence of perfect data, we use some proxies. Next slide. Uh, so this was a phased in approach. And in the phased in approach, basically, as I mentioned, we, will, we, we, we went through what we could, we set with the teams and what was important, I think, during this phased in approach was 
we did the first iteration of the model and then we sat with Simon and his team, Simon, our CFO, and the team and the top management team, which is Texco, to actually, and the and the managers, the district managers, um, we sat with those, we sat with the sub-district managers to try and go through and have buy-in for this uh, particular model. And with the input, we would go back and revise it. And of course, one of the big issues that came up time and time again was the issue of the census uh, information. Remember, this this whole model is based mostly on population um, risk adjustment. So with our data census data, it became a bit difficult in trying to get that buy in. Um, happy as we are that we have the new census data now, it still hasn't been totally broken down to the level where we can update the model. So in the um, after coming up with our model, we had a piecewise introduction. Uh, Simon can speak more to that, uh, where we used the model to allocate the excess funds that we had, I think, for 22-23 um, adjustment period, budget adjustment period. And um, the um, it was actually quite interesting to start seeing the model in play and start looking at uh, the different uh, service areas and how they also were going to use this excess amount allocated using the ERA model. And it was also at the same time decided that we would use it as the primary health care platform because through the iterations as well, we kind of also realized to use it at district uh, hospitals and to use it at regional hospitals, tertiary hospitals was not yet as firm in terms of methodology as we would want it to be. So we said we are going to uh, mostly use it on primary health care. Next slide. So in terms of the population risk adjustment, um, this is a methodology used to estimate the relative health risk across the different geographical areas. Uh, the data was cleaned and summarized at sub-district and district level. Um, an example given there for the sparsity factor, it is summarized as a population density for each sub-district, whilst premature mortality summarized uh, per capita for each sub-district. Next slide. So what did we get in terms of the results? These are just some of the results from the model. So where you see ERA allocation, this is after the risk adjustment, and then you have the budget percentage, which is the second uh, column there, the purple column. I'm sorry if you are colorblind, but um, that will be your bus amount, the allocation, government allocation, annual government allocation money that would have been allocated. Then you would have uh, historical allocation is uh, the budget was at that particular point in time. Then you had historical allocation. So the idea was to actually put it side by side and see what exactly would that look like. And as you can see with city of Cape Town, the ERA allocation with the um this was based on the different factors and the different percentages that we adjusted. Um, you could see that the ERA model was saying you should actually give. Cape Town less money. They are actually getting more than that amount of money they should. And you should kind of actually increase the money in some of the uh, districts like uh, West Coast and the Garden Route, which my apologies, Return Eden District C. So having this and being able to show this to the managers, to the district managers, to the sub-district managers, it's then started the conversation of, are we really getting less or should they really be getting more? Oh, okay, if it's uh, Central Karoo um, and we are saying they should be getting more, which risk adjustment factor, is it the sparsity adjustment factor that is actually showing that we should be giving them more? So trying to understand all those different uh, factors uh, was actually quite interesting because um, from a level of management, it got the managers to start really digging deep into the evidence that they they didn't know they had and that has been presented to them. 
Next slide. So in the what next? So the allocation of excess funds that I've mentioned um, in 22-23 was um, we used the ERA methodology along with other methodologies. Only service areas benefited from the ERA. Basically, we are saying the, the hospital, um, the, the, for those who not, not the support services, the EMS, the infrastructure, no, just the particular points where they have patient uh, services. Then the idea bringing ERA into the budgeting processes for 23, 24, uh, and the following MTF period, uh, looking at the health outcomes and costs and to track that over time and assess whether the ERA model improves equity and um, the value that has been delivered. Continued strengthening of the model. So interestingly enough, when we started this the six, seven years ago, we also had started the conversation on disease-related groups with Stephanas, as I mentioned, that he was one of the people who I worked with in on the project. So uh, for those who know, the DRG project in the department has grown extensively. We are now having two teams working on the DRG projects, and this also came as a result of the formative work and in trying to understand as part of the ERA model and in terms of the service demand that we have as a factor in the model, what is it that we can actually improve the model with? And that was understanding our disease related groups and the numbers that are actually coming in and linking them to the, to the different disease um, uh, reference points. So we are working on that. We have a team working on the clinical coding and we have um, myself and another team in the finance unit working on the DRG costing framework as well. And we are working with National with Moremi. Moremi is in the, in the group. He will be part of the panel. He's also there. So um, we are trying very hard to be playing Kumbaya with everyone. Then just another point to note, which came out of the era, which was quite interesting. There was years ago, um, a project at national level, a capitation project. We, uh, I think Percept was involved in that project. And within their calculations, it was estimated that 2.71 visits per person um, annually, each person would require at least 2.71 visits annually uh, for PHC. Oh, I, my apologies, I forgot on the DRG project as well. We are also working with um, some partners in the private sector and with NGOs as well who have been assisting us. Some of them are sitting on the panel today. So um, then we, from this project, what we then did was to take those 2.71 visas per person and put them in our model and look at the budget that we had and also look at the historical budgets and the bus um, amount that we had at that particular time and at that particular time each cost for vi per visit had been estimated to be 273 rands per visit so multiplying that by 2.71 would have given you 740 rands per person so we applied that to the dependent population of the western cape um, i think that's another point we need to note when we did this model, we looked at what we called the dependent population, where we looked at the different income um, levels as per the state's SA information. And we took percentages under each income level. For example, the lowest income level, we then said they would 100% use the public service. Then we go according to the different um, income levels and when we get to a point where your uh, your earnings are above 600,000 would we'll say you are definitely going to be using the medical aid. So that dependent population, we took that and we multiplied that by the 740 rand. And I can tell you, it showed us that we are so underfunded. It's crazy if we are going to actually work by these numbers. And if we think these numbers are the ones that would help us kind of reach that equity in terms of providing that 740 resource to the people of Western Cape. 
So, um, and another interesting aspect that we also then realized was if um, from the CMS kinds of medical schemes uh, data, Western Cape is basically covered for about 15.49% according to their 2022 data. So if we translate it to current, it basically gave us the numbers that about one point something, about 1,440,000 1, people are actually insured are beneficiaries actually are beneficiary not just insured they are beneficiaries within the western cape so which means out of the six point something million people in the western cape of which we are as public sector trying to budget for we have the risk of the four point something million people to actually uh, be catering for and those people are the ones that we then trying to model for within the era methodology. Next slide. So in terms of implementation challenges, understanding the methodology proved a bit more for some. Um, I think this happens every time there's change, uh, resistance to change, especially from some people who were used to, or facility managers who were used to getting their budget reallocated and having a way of working around their money and having to rethink more into it. And the issue of uncertainty on, if you're telling me City of Cape Town needs to be reduced in terms of how much they're getting, is this how it's gonna be? You're going to cause me problems as the manager here. And um, using ERA in concurrence with other expenditure reviewing tools. So um, I wouldn't call this a challenge as such. This I think was one of the strengths because ERA provided evidence that we then used with other expenditure reviewing tools against each other to actually say, is ERA saying something that we know or is it actually giving us new information? For something that we know, then it validated what we were doing. For new information, it gave us a space to start talking and reanalyzing and thinking of how do we go back and improve our data systems um, to be able to improve this model. Next slide. Um, so thank you to everyone and thank you to those who worked on the project. Uh, and I uh, just wanna give uh, thanks to Percept. They were quite huge in developing this project with uh, this model with us and Percept closed down, I think uh, at the end of last month. Uh, I just wanna say thank you to them as well. Thanks Sue, over to you. Thanks so much Plex for um, a really, really thorough and interesting and extremely well visualized and presented talk on a complex topic um presenting at least a decade of thinking in the western cape and possibly more so well done to you and the colleagues so i'd like to now um open for very brief um clarification or questions from the floor there were a few in the chat but let me see if anybody wants to put their hand up or turn their video on and actually make a verbal input If not, Plex, don't go away. I've got some questions for you. So um, the one question that came through in the chat is the following. So the question is, is the variance between the error allocations and the historical allocations mostly due to differences in population size or to the other factors added into the error formula? And if it's to do with the other factors, which do you think drove the difference the most? And this person is speculating that it could have been scarcity that have uh, might have um, driven the differences. What are your thoughts? And you, you're muted. Yeah, there you go. So we can't actually hear you, Plex. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Microphone had gone go up. It. So in terms of... Um, Central Karoo, it we did realize that it was scarcity that was actually causing a little bit of that. So what it actually meant was to really look re at um, their budget 
and look at what percentage that we allocated to sparsity in the model itself um, in terms of uh, the different risk adjustment factors that we had. And for the other provinces, it, it was actually different aspects. Um, I think I can give an example for within, within district. An example would be Kailicha. Um, one of the questions that was asked when we looked at the adjustment, um, risk adjustment results was one way in terms of age and sex, you would then wonder why is it an area you thought would be more needy than Kailicha actually, you'd think Kailicha would be more needy in terms of health um, services. But then when you dig deep in, you would actually see that Kailicha has a lot of more younger people. But mm -hmm. then if we then compared to some uh, sub districts, so if you then turn it around in some areas like Northern within Western, uh, within Cape Town as well, that's where then you would see that they have more older people. So it would mean that area in terms of that age um, and sex risk adjustment, you would actually find them being at a higher level than where there's younger people. But if we, initially we had HIV in there, where we tend on HIV factor, yeah. you would then see that with Kailicha, then that jumped because then you have a lot more people who have HIV, who are younger, um, Jolo and excited the and then you also have like that big jump thing. So it was basically different factors with, within different areas. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And let me just um, give one more quick question, um, which may not apply to the error thinking. But the question is, how would referrals between providers across geographic areas um, be reflected in capitation models? Can I can I leave that one to Simon? You can. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I think that that means, unless there are any other um, verbal questions from the floor, I think we're going to go to the next slide, please. So we're now going to um, ask our esteemed panel to please turn on their videos. Barry, Marie, Misha, Bia, and Simon. And to thank all of you once again for being with us this afternoon. Um, so colleagues, um, you, I think, um, have heard and and will well understand um, the work that, that um, Plaxi has been doing. So I'd like to ask you to offer your reflections. So we know that the ERA focuses on equitable resource allocation at the sub-district or district level using a risk-adjusted risk capitation approach. So my question is, drawing from your experience and based on what you have heard, what do you th think are the key challenges to implementation? And um, Simon, seeing as Plaxi just referred a question to you, I'm going to start with you. And then I'm going to come to Barry, then Shabir, then Marie, Maremi. So, Simon, what are your thoughts? Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. And I do appreciate that um, I get first dibs. So um, the rest of the panel members might, might find some repetition. So, I mean, I think, I think I want to talk about three challenges at a district level. Um, the one is universal, and that's the data sets uh, and what data sets are and aren't available um, and what the lowest common denominator, I guess, is in those data sets. Now, what we did when we des when we went down this particular journey with uh, the ERA, we designed the model so that we used it and adapted it within the Western Cape context, but we used official data that then, then is available for the rest of the country. To adapt and utilize the, the 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 model, I think the second the second issue for me is around capacities and capabilities, um, um, and 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 having the right people in the right places to be able to do this um, uh, uh, to manage the, the the allocations. 
And the third one that I would talk around is um, behaviors. Um, so one of the big problems when we come to moving resources around is everybody dives into a scarcity mindset. And so Plax spoke briefly about uh, behavior and change change management. And, and getting people's buy-in is easy when they get more. It's a it's a lot more difficult when they are getting less. But if you've got a a a, a model that is based on um, data that is available uh, across across the depth and the breadth of the country, then then that pull is slightly easier to swallow. But it becomes very difficult to swallow that pull at a facility level. It becomes easier to um, to swallow that pull. At a, at a slightly higher level, which is a sub district or a, d a district level, because then you can you can balance uh, 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 a little bit better with a broader view and a broader scope. Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll answer the cross border question when we come to the referral pathways, because um, mm -hmm. it, it becomes quite important in that context. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Barry, your thoughts. Uh, thanks to hi everyone. Uh, yeah, fascinating. Um, I mean, I think the taking the work to a more detailed granular level from the provincial equitable share is very valuable. I think there will be challenges if you go too granular because of you know how people will will access care is not necessarily bound by municipal borders mm -hmm. uh, on the way to work or maybe, you know, maybe the families living in different places. And I think that there's, I mean, we certainly see in the private sector that the, if we look at municipal boundaries versus reasonable boundaries of how people are actually using care at a primary, secondary, and tertiary level, those look very, very different in terms of sort of catchment areas. Um, so, but, but I think it is valuable to, to understand it from an equity and allocation point of view, to understand the sort of supply and demand uh, relationships at a at a smaller regional level, because I think it'll highlight where there's perhaps underinvestment in primary care, um, and uh, and you know there may be outcomes to support that. I mean, from an actuarial point of view, I think the important thing would be to monitor the allocated budget versus what was actually spent in an area over time. That would also show sort of glaring um, problems in the allocation. And then also monitor expected utilization levels versus actual utilization levels um, over some period of time after the allocation, because those budgets implicit in those those capitation budgets is is an underlying utilization assumption. If you're going top down, you, you, it's sort of implicit as opposed to building it from the bottom up. Um, and so, yeah, it's understanding it's those it's 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 really count and and. Uh, and utilization at a population level on a risk adjusted basis, I think will we'll yield uh, great insights. Thanks very much, Barry. Shabir? Myself. There you go. Yeah, there we are. So, yeah, thanks. Um, I think that uh, it's great presentation and it actually is great work done um, under the circumstance where. I think there is great inequity in the country and allocations are seriously a problem. Um, one of the challenges I have is that in some ways um, that as opposed to the payment as a capitation payment system still appears quite clumsy. I think that you know it is predicated on data that is going to be dated very quickly, even with the stats essay type of data. And the trickle down to actually be equitable will shift much more quickly than you could potentially adjust based on a what might be called hypothetical population, yeah. um, which is really what is happening right now. The adjustments are very useful. I'm quite surprised that the change is not as large. Um, I think the National Department of Health, Muremi will probably talk more, are looking at the question of the impact on the public service being uh, managed and measured much more carefully um, before you know they get um, the question of capitation-based funding, contracting happening directly at them. And I think that shadow budgeting will serve very well in terms of getting that clearer. But I think the, the, the question of factors being developed 
Uh, I think there's work around that. I think we need to think about that being not just this geography or a hypothetical population, but in fact, individual um, risk adjusters for individual patients enrolled for which payment will occur. And I think we must appreciate that even though the National Department is going with age and gender for the moment, I mean, it's it's a good start. Uh, morbidity and uh, the question of uh, socioeconomic uh, factors, including rurality, are very important considerations. But I'm sure that as one builds up the enrolled population, that data will become much more clearer and mm -hmm. will be able to be measured also as what kind of factor adjustments they do require um, that will then pan out. I think we uh, also are at risk in the setting, which I was not too clear as to the amount of risk being shared in that capitation model with mention of hospitals, et cetera. And I think uh, some of the issues I saw some comments is that if you make this far too wide a pool uh, shared by far too many providers, um, you're gonna find providers very unwilling to come into something where they have to figure out how they each divvy it up. And so I think that's going to be quite a disincentive for many people. In fact, it was the end of capitation in the US precisely because uh, the risk was far too wide uh, and cumbersome. So mm -hmm. these are just some of the comments I have. I think that if you're looking at, uh, and we'll come to the second question just now, but I think mm -hmm. those were just my comments uh, around what's been presented. Thank you. Thank you, Shabir. And I think that leads nicely into Maremi to uh, offer the final reflections on the first question and then we're going to get into the second question which I think the audience is particularly keen to hear about which is what happens when you move from a sort of district or sub-district capitation model which is what we're looking at now all the way down to the provider level so let's not go there yet Maremi let's hear what you thought about this one so far and then we'll come to the question of all the way down to the provider level. The privilege of speaking last is you simply say, I agree with what everybody else has said. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think Simon touches on a very important um, point, Susan, and, and I think it's around the data, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's the quality of the data at the different levels. What's the quality of data that you have in terms of the financials that are going to the district, but also if you look at the National Health Insurance Act, is the quality of the data that's going to the sub-district level. Um, Shabir touches on a very important point. I think the costing or the approach that um, Plax has presented ends at the sub-district or district level. What we're thinking about at Nation is to push that to actually the facility level, it would be a public clinic or a GP. I, and I see that's the next point we're going mm -hmm. to be touching. But before that, is it's also the analytics, right? We need to be clear what's the size of the population that you're allocating to a particular um, provider or to a particular sub-district. And Barry touches on the point, at what level do you set the granularity of the information? Because we do understand that within the South African context, we have a very mobile population. So yes, people will be expected to choose to register with a particular provider, but in certain instances, they might not be able to use that particular provider. And I saw on the chat one the question that was being asked was around referrals. So I, I think on a capitation rate, the referrals can only be picked up on a retrospective basis, but it's not referrals between GPs. It's referrals to a different level of care because within the capitation environment, you don't expect one GP to refer to another GP when the capitated fee is, is, is the same. The last point that I think we would need to touch on, which, which touches on the point that Shabir raises is around the shadow processing, and, and Simon touched on it, is that some providers, because of the change from historical budgets to capitation, will lose, right? So the issue is around the change management and for people to understand why is it that their budget is changing because it's linked to the populations that they're covering and the risk adjustment elements that are built into, into the progressive model. So it's, it's an issue about thinking clearly while we're moving towards this environment, what's the change management approach in order for providers and also for users to understand the new environment that's coming, but yeah. Stunning, thanks, Naremi. So the second question that I wanted to pose to the panel is, so we've been talking about the, the equitable share, share style model, where you're using a capitation formula to allocate budgets between districts and sub-districts. Now, if we start to talk about the NHI proposal, which is that capitation is, is going to form part 
of the provider payment mechanism, um, which is the model where, uh, for example, a GP practice or a community health center is paid a particular, call it a fee, per registered user in their practice. And this fee is calculated um, on, a, on a per capita basis, but also is adjusted for these proxies of need. So if we start to talk about that model, which I think is the one that everybody's interested in. So coming first again to Simon, what in your view would be the extra, so equity is at the heart of the NHI, what do you think is the equity extra equity benefit of taking capitation from the district down to the provider level and or what is the efficiency benefit and how do you see it playing out in practice so so maybe let me let me frame this through kind of the, the practice piece um and i'd like to say that the era model that was was presented here goes down to facility level it, it starts at the fundamental base of all facilities and then builds itself up. So, so we can, in, in, in the ERA model, actually go down to a facility level. Um, now, I, I think, look, capitation seems to be the right conversation to be having at a primary care level. It is definitely not a conversation that we can be having at a hospital a, a, a level and above. And of course, the complexity that comes in with the sub-district model is that you generally have a district hospital, which is the hub for 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 healthcare activity, um, is in the public in the public sector. So there is there is a there, there is a tension that exists within that that space and the impact that that then has on 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 the actual model. So I, I mean. I, I think when we talk about capitation, capitation in its own way, there's this kind of mixed or blended cap capitation model that I think we must, we must start thinking about. Mm -hmm. So in the public sector, it's very easy because we pay our, uh, we know what our staff mix should be. So we can talk at a clinic, we can talk at a, a, at a, at a, at a, at a, a day hospital, we know what our uh, expected norms and, and standards are, and we know what our, 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 our costs are going to be. So you can work out a standard uh, uh, capitation fee to cover the, the bare costs of, of, of a norm and standard. And whether that's a risk-adjusted capitation fee or a fixed capitation fee, it, it should cover X percentage of your operating costs. Then you can also, I think, you need to bring in some levels of fee-for-service or key programs. So vaccination targets, for example, or I suppose HPV is a vaccination. Yeah, there are a number of disease-specific uh, indicators that you can bring in for, for, for a specific um, service or fee-for-service. And the final one, which becomes quite critical is around an incentivization element. So a payment for, for, for performance within within that, that particular space. Now, obviously, well, not obviously, but in the public sector, it's a little bit easier because we kind of have this care continuum from community health workers all the way up to, 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 to central hospitals. Um, but when we start allocating funding to specific facilities, there is a danger of fragmentation of the care continuum that 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 that, that starts to creep into the space. Thanks, thanks. Thanks so much, Simon. Barry, your thoughts. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, so I, I mean, this is this is a area much closer to my historical practice because there, um, I mean, there's a fair bit of capitation. Uh, let me say experimentation in the private sector. Some for primary care. But also other lines, the, the pervasive uh, 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 use of capitation for optometry, dentistry, emergency services, etc. Um, but primary care has has a few experiments going. Some, I would say, uh, very limited full capitation. In other words, paying the doctor um, for his registered population on a full capitation basis. And I'll get into why that is. Um, 
there's there's some experiments going and i mean when i say experiments i mean you know there's fluidity of these things change from time to time um some hybrid models as simon mentioned so you know to balance the risk of under servicing in a capitation model i know of one model where they pay the gps uh, half capitation and half fee for service to try to balance the incentives of over and under servicing um the um you know you have to deal with all sorts of questions of the sort that have been raised in the chat and in the conversation so you know the the the, the main thing formulaically is having a numerator and denominator the numerator is the cost the denominator is the patients those must correspond so in other cost you know must be cost associated with that population registered at the practice so now that cost can be very thin so it could in, in the case of gps it can be just gps um or it can be gps plus medicine plus pathology plus radiology plus 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 all the way up to population management <clears throat> um it really it depends on on who's prepared to take the risk um, to come to your core question here, I mean, I don't want to sort of, I could, I could go on a long time talking about all the technicalities, but you're asking about equity in particular, mm -hmm. and this sort of, I mean, the equity considerations within the private sector are a whole different question. But in an NHI paradigm, Sue, so I think the 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 main equity gain is the idea that the NHI would purchase from public and private sector providers for the benefit of its whole population which at the moment doesn't happen. So, the, the, uh, so I think that the equity gain is a macro gain rather than a sort of small regional gain. And the macro gain is, you know, the the the, the much vaunted difference in per capita doctor cost accounts between public and private sector. And that the NHI, if it's able to secure the funds, will be able to then procure as a purchaser, as an independent purchaser, be able to buy GP services from private sector providers as well as public sector providers. And that should have a significant effect on equity. So I think that's the biggest potential for equity gain. Um, there are lots of nuances to work out to make sure that that's a level playing field between public and private purchasing and supply, medicine provision costs, all of those kind of things. Um, but yeah, uh, Maremi has his uh, plate full figuring all of that stuff out. He does indeed. Thanks, Barry. Shabir, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I, I, as I mentioned before, I think that the the idea is to take equity right down to the individual. And we must know that based on international literature, the risk adjusters are not complete. In other words, when you look at risk adjustment, it does not it does not account for the full range of variance in expenditure per patient. So these are clumsy still, and even at the patient level. But to be honest, you really do want to take it to the patient level, which is why I think given the strategic purchasing uh, idea in the NHI Act and the fact that capitation features strongly in strategic purchasing, that really the more useful idea is the payment, which is then basically a literally a budget allocated to every individual, depending on the age, gender, morbidity, uh, socioeconomic circumstances. And of course, you can look at about adding whatever variety of factors based on the data you have available. And that, I think, is a process over time to make that more and more robust. It still suffers its own problem. But I think that um, it, it, in terms of the contract uh, and the way that could work, and I'm sure Marimi has more information than I do, but uh, from the work done in the, with the National Treasury and some of the work in developing the cup in Shawello, in Sojoburg, and talking about it, it doesn't need to be altogether complicated, uh, especially for the private provider, because essentially it's them being able to be accredited and there's an interim accreditation available um, that helps them to get to be ready for OHSC in a few years. Uh, they then have to be linked into the HPRS, which is a single uh, numbering system linked to the DHA. Uh, and then for there to be an enrollment module where any individual with that you know, adjusted budget allocated to that person based on enrollment, hopefully valid and, and secure, but linked to DHA to provide a valid person joining it. And then depending on the actual cap pack package, so then will be the uh, payment system by capitation mostly. And I think National is looking at uh, right now a performance management system, which I think is probably more useful because um, it is focusing on, I think, what really needs to be the outcome. 
And that probably is as important as what do we look at the outcomes? How do we pay for outcomes based on data that might be available? So I think it it, it can become relatively simple. Uh, and of course, you know, looking at some of the questions, what might that package feature, uh, basic provision of care. And I think we've got some, um, you might say, um, uh, um, practice that's that's evident, both in the public service with the kind of primary care clinic uh, as a base of most access within the country to serve equity. And then you've got this huge number of private providers in the pri pu public space, uh, private sector, um, who are probably underpaid right now and would become a very easy resource for the NHI if they were in fact to be um, attracted to the uh, NHI contracting. And I think that there's it's literally a sweet spot for them to come on board. And I think if one has that simple system, you have a very good strong incentive for data to, to come through and then improve the equity allocation of funds uh, and with a very simple system. And I think uh, once a month payment, once a quarter payment uh, is relatively simple administration. I think the bigger challenge I have, and, and it's the kind of thing we've been looking at in Joburg is, well, who, where is the public service gonna get the money? Will it come to the clinic as the GP locally gets it? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to come back to the district and then all the same problems that exist at a province exists at the district because some of the districts are pretty large. And I think that to me is the clumsiness of this uh, allocation model. It does it, work it. But I think that if the payment has to occur at that level, you're going to find all sorts of uh, blunting of the strategic nature of capitation to get the provider, that is the actual nurse and doctor at that clinic level to feel the incentive to change their behavior and, and act accordingly. And I think that is to me going to be the challenge uh, with the NHI in terms of how it is going to uh, engage with the public service in the contracting scheme. And Thanks. I think you, you raise a very, very interesting point, and I'm so tempted to throw it to Simon what he thinks about that point, but I, I can't because I first must um, allow Maremi to. Uh, but I mean, I, I would, um, I think it, it, uh, that point might depend on um, provincial context to a certain extent. Um, the thought of bank accounts for clinics or community health centers, I think, um, provide some other complexities. But Maremi, what are your thoughts on the extra equity benefit of taking capitation down to the provider level? So I have a direct response to Shebe. Okay. The principle is the money is going to go straight to the provider. As much as is possible, the fund is not going to allocate money either to a provincial or district structure. The idea is the money goes straight to the facility or the provider that's contracted, that provider needs to be accredited and certified according to the standards that are outlined in the act. But then the provider becomes responsible and takes accountability for the money that's allocated to them for the management of the population that's registered to them. How that gets resolved is through the regulations and that process is still being worked out. But the idea is the money goes straight to, to the provider. So, so around the point around efficiency and, and equity gains, right? I think the principle starts from making public clinics or contracted GPs gatekeepers, right? So one of the things that you want to introduce is a rational use of services in the system. Users are expected to register with the provider and as much as is possible, they must then be able to first utilize that point at which they've registered as access into the system. So that brings a bit of rationalization and introduces efficiency in the system. And, and one of the things that we're pushing or, or planning to push as part of the strategic purchasing is to kind of move the provider environment into more multidisciplinary teams rather than just operating as solo practices. So some of the work that we're currently uh, structuring in the contracting units for primary healthcare is to work around, uh, and also the way we're structuring the NHI package is to work around multidisciplinary teams that principally start with the composition of a GP and um, and a nurse, and obviously then roll it out to include other other health health professionals. Our expectation is that that introduces patient coordinated care, right? More integrated care, patient centric care, which introduces a more rational use of available resources and allows patients access to a more structured team. I think one of the things that we need to think about in terms of moving towards the capitation level is also the, the reporting metrics that are associated with the, 
with the contract that you enter into with the providers, right? So you can make providers accountable for a population and be transparent in relation to the money that you allocate to them and trust them. But it's not only a trust relationship. There has to be an element that talks to reporting metrics. So what health metrics are you expecting them to report back around performance? Because you need to take that into account in terms of whether you're achieving health outcomes that are desirable or not. Um, it also touches on the issues that you need to monitor, right? It's not necessarily an efficient an efficiency outcome, but as long as you strengthen your monitoring and reporting, then you're able to track whether you're making an impact in, in particular areas. I think the last point I'd like to make around this is the, the efficiency or equity gains that, my, that will arise out of the shadow processing around the budgeting for clinics or for GPs is that progressively is going to tell us where the gaps are. And Plax in her presentation did speak to this around picking up gaps and also actively then identifying where you need to push more resources, taking into account where the gaps have been identified. So progressively, you'd be able to identify the equity gaps and, and, and address some of those gains as you roll out the capitation strategy, yeah. Thanks so much, Maremi. Lucy, I see you've put your video on. I'm thinking that's because you, you're going to enlighten us with something. No? Complete mistake. Apologies. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we, um, I think that I would like to allow some questions from, from the audience, but there are a lot of questions in the chat and I have not been able to simultaneously listen and make sense of what the panel is saying and also read the chat and so it's gonna be a little bit difficult for me to choose specific questions so i'm i'm asking you to put your hand up if you have a question or unmute yourself and go ahead it would also be fine turn your video on um to be kind to me my brain ah oh, thank you <laughs> well I, I don't know how to say your name but please go ahead Mr. Or uh, my Dr. Name is or I, I ran a capitation system with the DEPA, and uh, we had approximately uh, 30,000 patients on the, uh, on the 35,000 patients on the system. The most important thing is uh, an administration system. You must have the administration system in such a manner that you can allocate your, 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 your budgets according to function whether it is the specialist, hospitals, pathology, radiology, and things like that, then you should have that allocated to the service providers, and you should have a method of distribution of money, and you should have reserve funding for out-of-area benefits and for patients that may become cost, uh, that costs a lot. But that kind of a, an administration system is not available on the market and it was custom made for us. Because if you look at medical aids at the present moment, all they do is to ask for ICD-10 codes and, uh, and, 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 and NAPI codes. Uh, and that doesn't give you enough encounter details to answer the question what Morimi was talking about, about how do you monitor that you, the correct quality is given to the patient. So if you, uh, built in a front-end system which captures and counter details, simple things like blood pressure, uh, 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 visit X and other things, and automatically with your service provider providing you the, 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 the results of blood tests and things like that, you can actually build in an artificial intelligence system that can do outcome reviews for you and to know whether your patients are within control or not. And you'll have to build in mechanisms uh, to manage this system properly. It's not easy, but we had a system and it was a unique system. And it's given now to Nelson Mandela uh, University to a lady there who is, I don't know whether she's archived it or what, but you have to have a system like that. Otherwise it's very, very difficult to manage this process. Thank you so much for, for your input. Um, and before I give the panel a chance to add their comments, um, Helen, um, Professor Schneider, 
should I say, you've got a good question in the chat about contracting with plus 3,000 facilities. Would you like to pose your question out loud? So, well, there is, it looks like people are engaging in that discussion, but um, so we're shifting to a largely contracting environment. Um, and, you know, an NHI fund sitting in wherever is has very little sight of what happens in day-to-day -day transactions in a health facility. Um, so there is a, a very big principal agent problem here with the principal that contracts. Um, you know, there's information asymmetry. They won't really be able to control the behavior of the agents they contract. So how will that problem be addressed? Um, and and it relates a little bit to the role of the CUPS and, and Shabir was beginning to engage that. Um, so what is the role of the CUPS here? What does the CUPS look like? Is it a geographical unit? Um, uh, and, and then of course there's the DM DHMO, which is the government entity, over. Thanks, Helen. Sarika, you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I'm Sarika from Discovery Health. I just have a question um, to Maremi. Just in terms of patient choice, um, how will that be? How will that work within the model? So, if you know, it, as a patient, do you have a choice between one or more GPs during in, in the year, and then are you allowed to switch between them? And then, if you want to change your GP, you know, will, will that be um, accommodated for you know once a year? Um, once a year, and then how will that impact, you know, the funding flows? And then secondly, what about the other healthcare providers that are also in the primary care space, but are not the GPs and the nurses, for instance, the, the allied professionals and that, how, how, how do we envision that they're going to be reimbursed? Are they going to be part of the cap fee or is that going to be separate? Thank you. Thank you very much. Remy, I think a few of those questions are definitely coming in your direction. So I'm going to give you a chance to respond first, and then I'm going to see if any of the other panel members also want to weigh in on any of those questions. So Maremi, over to you. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Um, in relation to the first point that was raised by Dr. Pile, I mean, one of the things that the department is doing is we, we're, we're approaching this in an iterative um, manner, right? So the idea is not to go out to market and simply adopt a model or product that's readily available. There's five clusters under the branch currently. Um, risk fraud is still being built up, but there's other clusters that are looking at users and service provider management. There's the digital health solutions on what's the most appropriate platform for registering users. There's also the, um, um, sorry, there's my cluster that's looking at the benefit package and provider reimbursement mechanism. We do understand that there's a lot of stuff that's already happening in the market, but what we want to do is approach it in an iterative manner and develop something that is more reflective of what's happening and what is reflected in the act than simply adopting what it is. But we're happy to engage with stakeholders that have experience in these areas and can share with us information in relation to how we improve um, our processes. Helen raises, um, Prof Schneider, Helen, hi, sorry, uh, Moremi here. Yeah raises an important point around the principal agent relationship, right? The principle is the cup is a geographic structure at the sub-district level, right? But it's not a full representation of the fund in terms of the structure and, and operations of the fund at the national level. The cup is intended to be a proactive representation of the fund at the sub-district level that engages with the DHMO as it outlined in section 36 of the act, but actively ensuring that any problems that are happening, happening in terms of service provision, user satisfaction, they engage with the provider side and make sure that those are actively um, addressed. Those matters are also to be actively monitored by the user and service provider management cluster at the national level. So there's going to be um, active engagement in relation to that. Um, patient choice, yeah. In the act, it's very clear. Um, every individual will have a choice to either register with a public clinic or with a GP of their choice. What we need to work out is the logistics around how you um, get to move a provider media if you are dissatisfied with that process. 
And that's a process that's going to be covered in regulations and also in the protocol that's going to be worked through by user and service provider management cluster. But the principle is funding follows the user, right? And our approach is the fund is not going to make it per capita allocation to a provider on an annual basis. Shabir talked to this point earlier. It's either going to be on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis, but that decision hasn't been made yet. But once a user moves the provider, the funding for future allocation will have to move to the provider to which the user um, is registered. And, and, and we'll use the digital health solution uh, HPRS actually that's being implemented in the department as the basis for uh, tracking users. On the point around allied uh, reimbursement, in the current model, our focus, like I said, is in the MDT is to focus on GPs and nurses, but we do understand that there's also the need to expand that team progressively. In the first three to five years, our focus is around GPs and nurses, but progressively, as the services of the other um, uh, providers that you indicated are required, they will be reimbursed using a different approach rather than necessarily capitation. But progressively, as they get built into the multidisciplinary team, the capitation reimbursement rate will be adjusted to take into account of their inclusion into the team. The issue that needs to be addressed, and I see it was a point that was raised in the chat, is what is the splitting in relation to the reinvestment that is allocated as, on, on a basis of capitation. But the fund doesn't get involved in that. It's the responsibility of the multidisciplinary practice to take responsibility for that. Thanks, Marini. Thanks, Marini. I just thought you had frozen for a moment. Thanks so much for those answers. Um, we are nearly at the end of our time together. So I just want to see if there are any last burning points that any other members of the panel want to make. I mean, Sue, you asked you asked asked me a question um, around direct financing to the facilities and if the facilities are ready. Good. Yes. The, the, sim the simple answer to that question is no without a fundamental and a wholesale change to how the public sector operates. So, so um, I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, CUPS and uh, DMHOs. That at the moment is the sub-district and the district office in the primary, in, 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 in the district health model. And the idea is to make those national government components along with the um, the central hospitals as a start. So uh, there is this question that's been put that it's just going to simply move hundreds of thousands of people from a provincial employment to a national employment and then to pay facilities where at the moment the PFMA only allows you discretionary expenditure up to 2,000 Rand when it comes to petty cash. Um. Uh, yeah, so there are a lot of a lot of practicalities and legalities, and that's why I spoke earlier about the risk around structures um, that that need to be changed. Just in the public sector, you know, it's not like in, in the private sector where a GP practice has its own bank account, its own ability and capability to purchase and procure uh, the, the the various odds and sods that are needed. There are very very fundamental rules about public procurement and therefore you're going to need capacity and capability at a decentralized level which is going to add to cost and complexity um so there are there are I, I, we we need to be very mindful that there isn't going to be a singular solution to uh, the NHI and the implementation of the NHI or the 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 the, the capitation model or or the reimbursement model um or how people are going to be uh, uh, paid as 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 providers M much of that has not been determined um in fact none of it's been determined because all that we've got at the moment is a, is a is a is a bill that has been signed into an act as Moremi rightly said there are going to be regulations that are going to start coming forward that will start to explain the operationalization of this. So um, it's it's fascinating because, I mean, one of the primary things that we do want to do is to provide the most amount of autonomy to the, pro to pr the provider. That, that That's a principle. 
but somewhere along the line, there is going to have to be a practical uh, uh, balance between the the theory and 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 what is actually going to be able to be implemented on the ground without fundamentally destabilizing a system that works. Um, mm -hmm. It's the best system that we've got at the moment, and it and 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 it and it does work um, from an administrative perspective. So I thought I would add those three cents. Thank you. So okay. sh should we? I didn't see your hand. I apologize. He's um, put his hand down now. Thanks, oh. thanks, Alan. So we literally have no time left. Um, so Maremi, I will give you a chance to have the final say because I think that's that's a good thing to do. And Caressa, can I ask you to put up our closing slide while we hear from Maremi? And uh, Maremi, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to keep it quite brief. And Bulawa, I did see your um, hand, and I'm so sorry that I haven't got a chance to to allow your question. Maremi, the final word. I thought you were giving me another 10 minutes, Sue. But I'm no, kidding. no, I'm giving you one minute. <laughs> Maybe 30 no, seconds. No, no, I wanted to agree with Simon, right? The point is, it's not a big bang approach. It's provided for in the act that it's transitional process that's going to take a bit of time. Some of the stuff that um, Simon covers is stuff that still needs to be ventilated, either through the regulations, but also through different technical working groups that take into account DPSA, the provinces, the presidency, and, and national treasury. So it's not a big bang approach. And these things will need to be ventilated. Also, the regulations will not be published overnight and be implemented as is. It's going to be through a consultation process, and the act says it has to be three months. Um, so these things are um, iterative, but I think we just need to take into account that we need to make the health system work, make providers more accountable, and also make sure that the money that is meant for service provision actually gets to the provider and to the benefit of, of the users to achieve optimal health outcomes. So yeah, just wanted to make that point. Okay, thanks so much. And thank you to the panel and thank you to the audience for your very thought-provoking questions and your engagement with us. Um, I would like to bring the, the webinar to a close now by um, uh, also thanking the Salad webinar design team, that's Lucy Jolson, Caressa Governor, Nalu Tando, Lovu, and myself. And if you move to the next slide, please. Um, we have more. One slide back. Oopsie. <laughs> So that slide, um, which is coming back again, um, is, is what you can expect from us going forward. So a YouTube link to the recording will be shared with all attendees as per usual practice. Um, we Our next webinar is coming up in November and is focusing on the district health system as a learning health system. And please join our mailing list. Uh, we also operate the PASA HPSR listserv. So if you're interested, please join that. And thanks once again to everybody. I'm going to have to stay online to read all the questions in the chat, which I didn't have a chance to read. But what I did see was absolutely fascinating. And thanks once again to everybody and goodbye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, Thank you. Bye.